Greetings, students, and welcome to this special episode of The Professor Travel. I am your host, The Professor Travel, coming to you from Southern California. This is the website, the vlog, and the podcast that you come to to learn more about different travel destinations. Hopefully, this will spark a conversation to have you discuss them more. We would love to see you travel more and ultimately to enjoy life more. Now, you can reach me on a variety of different social media platforms, starting, of course, with my website at theprofessortravel.com. On YouTube, on Facebook, and now on TikTok, you can find me at The Professor Travel. Um, if you're an Instagrammer, you can find me there at the underscore professor underscore travel. If you're a Twitter, -er -er -er, you will find me on Twitter at The Professor TR1. And then finally, if you're a blogger, you can find me on Blogspot at theprofessortravel.blogspot.com. Today, I am welcoming back one of my favorite and exceptional visiting professors, uh, Marissa Paul Frederico. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, before we go into your credentials, again, because <laughs> this picture is amazing, and I apologize for the people on the podcast who are not hearing this or can't see it. Um, they're a little, you got, you got to tell me the story of you eating a polar bear. It looks yeah, like, what is going on here? This was our first polar bear sighting, and um, the two people standing behind me are just people I met on, on the trip. We met at Baggage Claim, and everybody thought we came on the trip together, uh, but um, I, the first polar bear we, a sighting was right by the lodge, which I'll go into. Um, and there was this gentleman from Singapore who didn't speak a lot of English. And he, I asked him to, you know, please take a photograph of, of us with the polar bear. And he went to me and I'm like, what? And he said, so I, I did it. And that's what he snapped. <laughs> It's hilarious. It's very funny. It's hilarious. I just, I just, I was laughing. He was the, the funniest guy. He just was. What a sense of humor he had. <laughs> that is so funny. Okay, so for the people who unfortunately are not familiar with you, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, say maybe some of your educational credentials, and certainly a lot of the places that you've traveled to. You bet. Um, I my educational credentials. Um, oh wow. Okay. Um, I have a bachelor's in theater and psychology. Really odd. Um, and then I have an, an MBA in global business. And then I have, um, I'm all but dissertation in two different doctorates so, in international business. Uh, I did go to school um, abroad at University of London, as well as for my doctorate, University of South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I've traveled uh, all over the world. Um, I have yet to reach my final continent of Antarctica, but that is next year. That is Yay! in the books. So um <laughs> Uh, down payment down there and it's <laughs> it's gonna happen do you do you um, know about how many different countries you traveled to previously you know i i want to say it's about 70 okay that's fantastic but, but it's it's you know i feel like i barely made a dent in the world um you know i i, I was in travel for uh, almost 30 years uh, then um simultaneously kind of knew the writing was on the wall for the travel industry and um, segued into becoming a professor of uh, international business and business law. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, that's what I do now. I, I teach for Oregon Tech mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm also a, an online tutor uh, in my spare time, which I don't have any of. <laughs> well, thank you for sparing all of like a little while for me. I really appreciate it. You bet. You bet. Sorry, pull... we had to, sorry, we had to delay. <laughs> I know your I know your schedule. It's just crazy. So let's talk about where you decided to go on this trip. Talk to me a little bit about where you decided to go and why. Well, um, after losing my mind with COVID um, restrictions for so long, and it's not that I hadn't done some travel during COVID, which, which I had domestically, but I'm, I'm an international traveler. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's my thing. Yeah. Um, I lost a very, very dear friend in April and um, decided, you know, I had some things on my bucket list and I wasn't going to wait any longer. So I started doing research. And one of the things I've always wanted to do is see the polar bears. And, uh, and oh, sorry, I didn't, I neglected to say that I'm also a photographer. <laughs> Forgot the important part. Yeah, I'm also a, a cultural photographer. And um, so I wanted to see the polar bears and photograph polar bears. And I did a lot of research and I found this particular uh, tour, which we can talk about. And, um, and the rest is history. 
Excellent. So how long in advance were you planning to do this for? Like, was this just something that started in like maybe when COVID happened and when you got the news of your friend or was it something that occurred later on and you were like, hmm, I, I really think I need to make this shift at this point in my life. No, it was, um, it's, it's, it's a fortuitous, it's going to sound odd, but a little bit of a fortuitous series of events. Um, when I lost my friend, it was just this past April, it was not due to COVID. Um, it, 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 it kind of triggered something in me that, you know, okay, you know what, I'm vaccinated, things are starting to open up, um, I can go international. And I started looking and typically to do this trip, you need to plan a year or two in advance mm -hmm. um, because they're very small groups and it's a very limited, polar bear season is a very, very limited time. Um, but I got lucky because, you know, it was a day to day kind of thing, whether Canada was going to open up and whether polar bear season was going to happen. Uh, well, you know, for visitors, um, there were spaces available. Um, you know, people had canceled, uh, obviously, um, uh, not, not willing to travel. Uh, and these are people that had planned, you know, a year or two in advance. So I got a space and, you know, fully refundable, all that good stuff, but, um, you know, or, or movable to another year. But I thought, you know what, it's going to happen this year. It, it, it's the, the space is there. It's meant to be. And so I grabbed it. Okay. So let me ask you this, because... I'm curious as to like I've I've looked at a lot of different cruise lines that are out there and usually they're larger cruises and they have thousands of people you you're looking at something that's I think a little bit more of a curated experience talk to me a little bit about what you were looking at 100% curated um you can't just go see polar bears it, I mean it, it's just not going to happen uh you can there are basically two places to go and uh see polar bears for, for, you know, that are, that are accessible. Um, one is going up to uh, uh, Svalbard and Spitsbergen on a cruise. And the other one is to go up to Churchill, Canada. Now I looked at both. Um, I decided against Svalbard, Spitsbergen because uh, so many people had said that, well, if they were lucky enough to see a polar bear it was from a distance and that wasn't the experience I was looking for. So then I started looking into land options and that's when I found uh, natural habitat, which is the travel arm of the world wildlife fund. Oh, nice. So that's what, that's what hooked me is the fact that it was the travel arm of the world wildlife fund. So the focus is con uh, conservation. The focus is, you know, zero carbon emissions and all these other things. Um, it, it, it really intrigued me. Um, these are very small uh, groups. They limit it to, I think, I want to say there were 24 people on the trip. Um, maybe, no, no, maybe 29, sorry, 29, but they split you into two groups. So you're really in a small group and you go, you know, you go out on the rovers and, um, and you have an immersive experience. And there are two, also two ways to do it. You can do it where you um, stay in town and you go out onto the tundra every day. Um, I chose the second option, which we'll get more into as you, as you see the, some of the photographs as well. Um, it's a tundra lodge and it, that intrigued me and it was more expensive. But um, when you're spending this kind of money to go up there, I happened to have had the extra money to spend. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do, you can get up there, um, and, and do a trip with these people, uh, from the city for about, I think, $5,600, okay. which is still pricey and, you know, still pricey for a lot of people, but, but it's not out of the, out of it, the it, realm of possibility for a more curated exactly. experience. Yeah, exactly. For the, for the type of experience you're talking about, it's, it's, it's really relatively inexpensive. Now that doesn't include your airfare to Winnipeg, but that does include the internal charter plane. Uh, up to Churchill, up to the Arctic. Okay. So it's real, relatively um, inexpensive. Um, I, oh, sorry, no, they do charge extra for the internal. Sorry, sorry, I misquoted. But That's okay. um, I chose the, uh, to spend a little bit more uh, money because I wanted to stay on the tundra. Mm. So this particular uh, trip, we were 
three nights, four nights, three or four nights, I can't remember now, three or four nights on the tundra in this very unique, there are only two in the world, um, it's, it's, it's called a, like a tundra train, and you'll, you'll see a photograph in a little bit, um, it, it's, it is like a train, but it's, it's up on big five foot tires, <laughs> um, it is, um, you know, zero emissions, there's no, there's no generator going all night, although you do have, um, you know, lights and, um, all these things, but, you know, of course, no internet, no phone service, which was fantastic. That's was one of the things I was looking forward to the most, <laughs> being completely cut off. Of course, they, they have an emergency satellite phone, yeah. but you know, it's, um, that's, that was, that was the excitement. That was the exciting part for me. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Let's talk about preparing for this ahead of time. Now, when you plan for anything like this, especially going to a place as remote as you're looking at, and potentially for next year when you're looking at going to the Antarctic as well. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of what kind of preparation requirements do you need in terms of like a visa, any type of travel medications, um, special arrangements for travel, anything like that at all? For Churchill, Canada, nothing, which is, you know, great for uh, uh, any travelers, you know, coming from the United States. It's, you know, very simple. Um, except for the fact of, you know, traveling during COVID, um, over the period of time when we were there, we'd had four, well, I had one test before I left, um, and three additional tests. Um, when I landed, I got spot checked, uh, in Canada for another PCR test. Fine. No problem. Um, and then the, the travel company themselves, before you go to Churchill, they do another test. And then before you leave to come back to the United States, they provide a test for you for the United States. So everything is very, very uh, conscientious and, and they take care of everything. I'm not used to that. I'm used to, you know, throwing a, a, you know, a backpack or a suitcase, you know, and, and just going. So this was really, really nice. Um, natural habitat uh, takes such good care. They, they've just got it nailed down. There was a lot of prep work I know that I had to do in October in preparation for going to somewhere as simple as Costa Rica. Yeah. And I know that I had to test on the way out. And then when we were ready to go, they were saying, oh, you need to test to get back to the United States. And I was like, I, I spaced on that. I was like, I, how, I need to figure out something. They're like, don't worry about it. They test at the airport. Everybody's tested. Don't yeah. don't stress yourself, because yeah. because that's another thing. It's causing a lot of people stress and just being able to find the places where you can get tested and do all that kind of stuff. So they were able to do a test for me at at the Costa Rica airport or at the one in uh, San Jose there. Yeah, and it took an hour. I was able to get the uh, get a a, ne somebody's, a negative test, and they were able to give me my ticket like immediately after I uploaded the information. Was your process very similar to that or? It was. Um, they did. Uh, they had a, a, a table set up in um, Churchill Airport, which is, I mean, a house is bigger than Churchill Airport. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I mean, no, really, it is. Really, it is. <laughs> um, I, it's no joke. Um, and but they, you know, very nice. I mean, they're Canadian. It, they're so nice. <laughs> you know, they apologize for having to swab your nose. It's just, it's, it's just you know. <laughs> well, that's, there that's you go. Matter. So... <laughs> Um, they, uh, yeah, they took care of that, uh, right at the airport. Um, if you were staying in Canada longer, you didn't do it there, of course, but I was going home the next day and mm. it was still the three day window. So, um, now it is down to a 24 hour window, yeah. um, because of Omicron, um, which I mean, Omicron versus Godzilla is the next movie coming out, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> the name is odd, but um yeah so they, they took care of that um i think before we even hit uh or the minute we landed it back in winnipeg uh the results were back you know on my phone so everything yeah. was good to go now now one thing i will say that, that in, in preparation for going on something like this that, that is a little bit difficult you are going to the lower arctic um it's not within the arctic circle it's not 66 degrees north but um it, Winnipeg, Canada itself is one of the, uh, the second coldest city on the planet, um, which I had no idea about. Um, going up to Churchill and then onto the tundra where, you know, obviously there are no trees or, you know, very little cold protection. Yeah. Um, it, it, like right now it is, I think about zero up there. 
because it is it's it's lower arctic because it interestingly enough it's on the same latitude basically as london england but far far colder and considered the arctic because of the way the gulf stream goes and the way you know arctic winds flow um it, it is a cold spot which is why you get the polar bears um so you you have i mean we were i was going in kind of mid-season so there was no snow on the ground yet which which was fine i, I mean i liked the color contrast uh, i was fine with it either way with ice and snow or not mm -hmm. um but you you really have to be prepared with layers um you can see there we were outside in in almost no you know no yeah. heavy clothing I was going to say you normally travel on the shoulder season, don't you? I do, but but you know something like the polar bears. I mean, there's a season, and it's a short season, and you you go when they're there. So yeah. there, there's no there's no option. So when considering prepacking, you're looking at things like everything has to layer, and you have to be like, were have to you be prepared? Were you were you hit by any like rain or sleet up there as well? I obviously imagine the cold is. Bone no, it, it, it didn't. That didn't start until the next week. Okay. So we were really fortunate. We had some wow. absolutely gorgeous weather, a clear skies. We we get, which is unusual. <laughs> Although <laughs> Churchill is really, um, it's really a place to see the aurora because they get it about three hundred twenty five days a year. Oh my gosh! So it, it's a fantastic place for that. But um, you know, they nat natural habitat does provide boots and jackets. Okay. Good. And they give that to you in Winnipeg uh, for loan, of course. Um, I sure. use my own boots. Um, I have, you know, arthritis in my feet. And so I have my own winter Solomon boots, which I highly recommend to anybody. <laughs> I'm not paid by them. I just recommend them. They're fantastic. Um, and then I took their parka. I used their parka. But I had my layers and, and never used most of them. So <laughs> it's like better to have really, it and not need than not have it. Really, really, yeah. It's, I, really good time to travel during the course of the year especially yeah. if you can do it so without a hat and scarf in certain time yeah. frames so that's and, great and one thing and one thing i will suggest to your travelers is packing cubes i've never really used packing oh, yeah. cubes before they were suggested on our pre-departure i bought them inexpensively you can get them on amazon you can pretty get them at rei i think pretty much anywhere um and wow does it save space they're incredible, especially if you're packing, you know, a sweater or, or sweatshirts or, you know, some heavier clothing. They're fantastic. For the benefit of my students, can you can you talk to us a little bit more about packing cubes? Because it's something I've heard other travelers talk about, and I'm a little bit aware of it, but I haven't actually used them myself. Sure, you bet. This was my first time too. I love them. I'll never, I'll never travel without them again. Um, they're they're individual. Uh, now there are two kinds of packing cubes. They're just regular packing cubes that you can, you know, just put in your suitcase. And there are ones that you can compress. I say get the compressible ones um, because that's where you're getting your, your packing benefit. Um, they're, they come in, you know, usually it's four pack and it comes in, you know, three different sizes, two of the medium size, one larger and one smaller. And you, you put your things in there and then you zip it up and it literally compresses everything without any kind of tools or what have you. That's one benefit. The other benefit is if you you can you know put a piece of tape on the outside saying um, uh, uh, you know undergarments, um, another tape on the outside of another one saying jeans or or whatever you know. Um, and so that way you know if you're especially if you're in cramped quarters, which you are on the tundra train, the tundra lodge, you want to be able to grab the right one. Mm. And, and that made it super easy without, you know, digging through your bag to look for things. You can just look at, the, look at the packs, pull all the packs out, look at the packs and grab the ones you need. Makes sense. It's like tabs. <laughs> Almost like tabs. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It, so I highly recommend packing. Yours. Excellent. I'm, I'm definitely going to consider that. So thank you. Um, let's talk about the actual journey to get to the destination in Churchill. Let's start from, you live in the Portland area, yes. Portland, Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Uh, as opposed to Portland, Maine. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's talk about, um, did you, did you drive to the airport in Portland? Did you, did you go up to Washington instead? What was, where did you leave from? Um, no, Port, I left from uh, PDX, Portland airport. Um, I, I just take the train. Uh, we have okay. a great um, uh, city 
max system okay. um, that goes right to the terminal. Um, so I, I had my wife uh, drop me off at the Darnier station, not okay. too far from us. Perfect. And then I take the train in and then Bob's your uncle, you're at the airport. And uh, yeah, the check-in with um, Air Canada. I went with Air Canada. Okay. And the flight was Portland, Vancouver, Vancouver, Winnipeg. Okay. So your, your destination, uh, your landing is the uh, destination is Winnipeg. Okay. Um, pretty uneventful. Um, you know, I, I have all the bills and whistles with, you know, TSA pre-check and all that other stuff. So I got global entry myself. So I, I just got global entry. I finally did it. That's which oh. is why I was in Seattle last week. <laughs> it's fantastic. I love it. I <laughs> yeah, absolutely do, love it. Yeah. To do my interview. Um, and um, so all that, all that's very simple. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, going out of going out and, and to get in, to get into Canada from the United States uh, to Winnipeg, you can pretty much go from anywhere. It's, it's, it's easily doable. Did you spend time just, did you spend like time overnight in Winnipeg waiting for the plane to get to Churchill or did you immediately jump? From no, no, Winnipeg? you're, you're overnight. Now I went a day, I decided to go a day early because I didn't want to risk uh, any, you know, late flights and missing anything. I agree. So I stayed two nights at, um, at the hotel. They put us up at the Fort Geary hotel, very historic, mm -hmm. um, uh, haunted. Ooh. And uh, I got to be on the haunted floor, which was fun. <laughs> <laughs> no ghosts. Sorry. Um, uh, but, uh, lovely hotel, beautiful hotel, historic hotel in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, they, they really don't, they don't chintz on anything. Um, they, they, they said like breakfast wasn't included. And yet every morning there was a buffet breakfast, even the extra days. So yeah, okay. they lied and they did <laughs> this beautiful breakfast. <laughs> um, because of course it's Canada and they have to be nice. So there I you guess, go. I guess, I don't know. Um, so uh, yeah. And I, I mean, it's, you know, it was, it was just really well done, but I, um, they do put you up at least it, at least one night, but it is, and that's included. Mm -hmm. um, I, I paid extra for the second night because I just wanted to be sure I was there. Um, and then the night before they do a welcome dinner. Okay. And where they kind of, you know, prep you for what to expect. And, you know, um, it, it's less about what to do and what not to do. Um, because, I mean, I think people are pretty you know, the people that are spending this kind of money to go to a thing like this are, are well aware of what to do and what not to do. And they don't treat yeah. you like your children. Um, they treat you like you're, you know, like you're adults and you, you get it. Um, and so that, that was really nice that they, you know, prepped you. And then it, you, you get to meet your, your two guides because they split you up into two groups. Okay. Um, so you get to meet the two guides and, um, and then the next morning, uh, early in the morning, off you go on the, they, you know, they co collect your bags, you bleary eyed, wake up, have your <laughs> breakfast, uh, head to the bus, and then they take you to the airport. What's really nice is you don't have to go through security or anything because they charter the plane. Mm -hmm. um, nice. Because they, they, that's, they, it's just wonderful. And it's just the 20 of you. So, I mean, there you go. You know, 20, well, 29 of us. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and they do uh, sometimes on the plane are people that work for NAVHAB going back and forth, uh, people from the town of Churchill, because um, if, if they work for NAVHAB, they, they're allowed to, you know, go because the, that internal flight, even for locals, is about $1,000 round trip. I can imagine. It, it is what domestic air travel in Canada is very expensive. Oh. I wonder why is that? Do you suppose? I I I I don't know. Um, my guess is that it's sparse, so um, so they do charge a premium, and there's not there is no competition. I mean, it's Air Canada. That's it. And um, you know, it, the town of Churchill is is a story unto itself, uh, but it's only a, a town of about eight hundred people, oh. and you know, there is the only way to get there. Well, there are two ways now, uh, but the, uh, for the for two years, uh, the only way to get there was by aircraft. Um, so it was, they were very, very sad story. They were, they were kind of locked off, uh, blocked off from the world because of a bad storm in 2017 that had um, destroyed the rail track. Oh no. And uh, Canada was battling with an American company and it, it, in two years they had no train. Oh, gosh. 
So they just got their train in 2019 back and then COVID hit. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. So, you know, that, 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 that put a really, really big hardship on the people of Churchill. Uh, lovely, lovely people. Great film out there. Uh, it's called No, I'm Here. Um, it's, you can, you can, I, it's free if you're in Canada, <laughs> but um, I, you may be able to download it some way, but it's, it's, it's just, it's breathtaking. It's really makes you feel what they felt okay. being cut off from the world. A couple of other questions really quick. Um, when you were in Winnipeg, did you have any, like, like, did, did you do anything while you were there? Um, as far or just for the 24 hours I did um, I, I made the most of my 24 hours um, I went to uh, and I highly recommend this the Museum of uh, Human Rights oh nice uh, in Winnipeg um, just a stunning stunning uh, museum that covers you know genocides from all over the world and um, the treatment of indigenous people First Nations people and um, there are films playing that are in their own words, and it's just absolutely well done, beautiful museum. There's there's another uh, new museum, an Inuit museum, which I did not have time to go to, unfortunately, but I hear it, it's new, and I hear it is phenomenal and has um, some the largest collection of Inuit art in the world. Okay. Um, and, and, and for for your listeners, um, Inuit is is the, there are other uh, First Nations people, of course, all over Canada. Uh, Inuit are what, as children, we knew as Eskimos. Um, that's uh, so that's the Inuit people. Those are the the First Nations people really of the Arctic. Excellent, thank you. And then the second question I wanted to ask is, as you're going into this, as you're going into Churchill and planning out everything between the guides that have that have you here is this kind of like free form do they have like a predetermined excursion idea of what's going on what what you guys are going to see as you go through this process can you tell can you structure me on how this process went yeah once they have you, <laughs> have you. <laughs> once you're in their once you're in their control um it, it's kind of pre-planned i mean the the you know as far as um you know, you're flying up there, then, you know, you get on a tundra buggy, um, they take care of your bags and everything, and, and you go off looking for the polar bears right away on your way out to the tundra buggy. So you spend the day out on the tundra and, um, you know, the afternoon, I should say. Um, and then, then the rest of it is planned because um, it's planned in the sense that kind of like in the same way in Africa, uh, you're going to go out on the tundra in the tundra buggy, but where, where we end up depends on, you know, where we see. And, and there was one day that we spent two hours watching a mother and her cup, you know, because, because we were all just, just fascinated with this, this mother and her, a yearling, I should say, she wasn't a tiny cup. But um, yeah, so that's that's kind of free form as to what you might see and what where you might drive. And we'll have those pictures in just a second here as well. Um, so talk to me about the lodge. So to, what is this lodge like? Incredible. <laughs> it, I'm telling you, uh, listeners, if you have the chance to experience this lodge, please do so. Um, there are two lodges out there. One is run by actually another company I, I know nothing about. Um, but this one is run by uh, a, a Natural Habitat, um, which again is an arm, the travel arm of the World Wildlife Fund. So it's run in conjunction. The lodge is um, narrow, like a train. It's uh, their cabins on with an aisle in the middle and they're one person cabins. So, I mean, even if you're going up there with a spouse or a friend, you're in your own cabin. You'll be next to each other or across from each other, but they're one person cabins and some are uppers and some are lowers, but so that you have a space for your bags and then your bed and there's a light and there are plugs to charge your, your goodies. Um, and then there is a lounge, a lounge car. So there are two cars that are um, residential. There are four showers, I think, four bath, no, four bathrooms with two showers. That was never an issue. Uh, plenty of time for people to take showers. 
um, quiet time. You couldn't take showers after a certain time, which was, or before a certain time, highly appreciated. Uh, and water is trucked in. I was going to uh, say, is hot water a problem? Or Not at all. Okay. Hot water was not a problem. They, they truck it in and then they have a hot water generating system. Okay. Um, it, heated, lovely. In fact, if you want cooler air, you need to cl uh, close your door. Um, and then, so then there's a lounge car and the lounge car has a, like a, a, a pot belly stove and that warms it up in, you know, comfortable chairs. And that's where they did their, you know, evening talks and, and showed us a couple movies and things like that. Or you could just socialize. Um, the, the little bar was there with, you know, uh, complimentary beer and sodas and wine and stuff. Um, you could bring your own, you were welcome to bring your own hard alcohol if you wanted. That was, that was said right off the bat. We do not supply that. If you like that and want that, please bring your own. Um, and then the next car over was the kitchen. And then there's one car beyond that. And that's where the staff uh, lives, the permanent staff lives. Uh, they live out there for eight weeks. And then the kitchen is there and the ki kitchen, kitchen and dining room. And it's so well organized. Um, the chef was a, a young guy and the food was outstanding. I mean, the first night we were there, we had um, Arctic char and it presented like you're in a five-star restaurant. Oh my it gosh. Beautiful, beautiful. The food was exquisite. And in the true Canadian nature, you know, you get this exquisite plate and they come around and say, if anybody wants any more, just let us know. You know? <laughs> it's just, it's okay. You know, it was just, yeah, it was, it was, it's really well organized. This, uh, this Tundra Lodge. And how long were you there for? I think I was there four nights. Okay. And oh, was the, so was the itinerary planned or was it pretty much ad hoc depending upon where the sightings for the polar bears were located at? No, it, well, yes and no. It was planned in that um, right away at the orientation dinner, we were separated into two groups, uh, the snowy owls and the Arctic foxes. Okay. <laughs> I was a snowy owl. And, very um, wise, very wise, by the way. Very wise, very wise. Uh, well, my, my school's mo uh, mascot is the owl. So. Oh, there you go. See you. Um, so um, I, was, I was with the snowy owls. And when you went out on the tundra buggy, you were with your group. Um, so one day, uh, well, the first day getting out there, we were all together. Um, then the second day, uh, we had two vehicles. So we both groups were out on the tundra all day long. Okay. Um, and that, then you're winging it as to where you're going to drive, where you're going to go. Um, the second day, the other group went out in the morning and we stayed on the tundra lodge for half the day. And then switched in the afternoon. We went out and they stayed on the Tundra Lodge uh, for the rest of the day. You're not going out at night or anything like that. It's way too cold. And uh, No, no, you're no, but you, and you don't need to, you can't really see anything on the Tundra at night. Now the lodge does have lights. So, uh, so, you know, and you're, you're free to walk in between uh, the cars. It's like a train. There, there's a platform in between each car. Okay. And then there's a big viewing platform in the back as well. And, you know, you're free to go out there any time of the night um, and, you know, see if there's a, a bear lurking. Um, <laughs> you're, you're protected. You're, you are five feet up with, you know, um, with, with stuff there. Um, although bears can get as high as, you know, stretch as high as nine feet tall. Yeah. Um, Just stay away from the sides, I think, is what they're try trying to reiterate there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, okay. So... Based upon that, how, like, actually, I'm going to skip to the return part because we're going to talk about the various different pictures that you yeah. sent over. So we'll, we'll see kind of what some of the excursions look like and, and various different things that you did. Um, okay. But was returning back to the States any hassle? Was there any concerns about anything that happened? Not at all. Um, they, you know, we got to see the town of Churchill for half a day that last day, which was really nice. And they fly us back um overnight in uh churchill again uh, sorry winnipeg again mm -hmm. and then early the next morning was my flight back and i mean no, nobody even really looked i mean they, the airline looked at my covid test of course yeah uh, when i got back to the united states i i didn't have a single border officer ask for my covid test 
it's so funny uh you, you know how busy like for me yeah. down here in southern california you know how busy southern california can be especially lax yeah when we got back into lax now granted we were in first class mm-hmm. and we got off the plane we had we we only had our backpacks we did not have like any suitcases right. or anything we had to claim from disembarkation through tsa and customs into the airport and then finally picking up our car it was 15 minutes wow i am that's not unusual joking. for lax <laughs> that is extraordinarily <laughs> extraordinarily what? different i was like i was like is this is this happening is this happening <laughs> Well, what's, what's different about Canada is you do go through uh, U.S. Uh, customs and passport control in your last Canadian city. Okay. You actually don't go through passport control, passport and customs control in the United States, which makes it really nice because you never have to pick up your luggage. Yeah. Um, you never you never actually have to you know show anybody your luggage because it's it's there's that there's that gentleman's agreement. Um, and you know, but so I went actually through customs in Vancouver. Uh, and passport control and um, you know they clearly say you are now in the United States for 10 minutes uh, so yeah it's, it's pretty funny um, but yeah it, it was this very simple process okay so before we move on I want us to take a look at some of these extraordinary pictures that you took talk to me about this these polar bears are just gorgeous uh, you know, childhood dreams of polar bears in the wild, and there they are. You know, it, it's that's one of the reasons I cannot stress to your listeners enough that if um, if they want to see polar bears up close, they are going to see them on this trip. Doesn't matter what week they go, doesn't matter what year they go, they will see them. Um, as opposed to some other options like the cruise where you may or may not. Uh, Churchill has the largest, uh, Churchill Canada has the largest concentration of polar bears in the world. And the polar bears actually do come into town. In fact, the day before we went back to town, they had to, you know, get three out of there. Um, They have a polar bear jail. (laughs) (laughs) When when polar bears wander into town, they, they put them into the jail um they do not feed them because they they keep them in their natural state uh, and then they will airlift them out 100 miles um so hopefully they don't come back into town yeah. but the bear on the left um a female um she waiting for the ice on hudson bay that's what they're doing there in churchill they're waiting for hudson bay to freeze so okay. they can go out there and um you know get food eat seals um they're they're hungry they haven't eaten you know all summer um yeah they're just coming out of hibernation so (laughs) yeah and they and they don't really hibernate the way we think of hibernation um i mean when i think of hibernation i'm not coming out of my room and i'm sleeping um for them it's more like "Mm, they're not coming out of their room but they, they don't they don't they only stay in dens to give birth um, they, the polar bears don't really hibernate. Um, they okay. will eat, uh, berries, um, uh, their blueberries during the summer and things like that. I didn't um, know they, I did not know that they were omnivores. That's interesting. Yeah, they, they are definitely omnivores. I mean, they're most, they're mostly, uh, carnivore, yeah. but, but they, <laughs> but they will eat, you know, berries and, and things like that. Um, the, the mother, it, it has to be so well fed during feeding season Um, in order for any cubs to survive. Um, Typically, you know, she'll have two. If she has three, that third one is not going to survive. If she has two, probably only one will survive. Uh, That's how harsh the the ecosystem is. Um, The second picture... um, It's it's adorable, by the way, first off. Yeah, right, right. A little (laughs) mama love there. Um, The the picture to the right, you can see um, there's a little darkness on his bum Mm -hmm. um, because he was, during the summer, playing in the blueberry bushes. So he got the nickname Blueberry Bum. (laughs) And and that's his mama. And uh, he's a yearling. 
Now he was about six feet tall, standing up. That's in, the, in fact the picture, the lower right corner. That's mm-hmm. him standing up. Oh goodness! Um, right, right at our vehicle, and um, he stood about six feet tall. And he's this is his last season with Mama. Um, he's he's about probably about a year and a half now, okay. and um, after this season, he will be on his own. So, um, you know, from a human perspective, looking at this, we're like, oh, the poor thing has to leave mama, you know, but that's, that's what they do. That's- yeah, but, I, but he's already six feet tall. I mean, he's going to be, he's, he's going to be fine. Boy. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's probably going to be at least a nine footer. This, 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 this was a big baby. Um, those paws on the lower left are his feet. Oh, goodness. At, at a year and a half old. Goodness gracious. So, um, and then the, the, the picture top right, that's another mom, uh, another female uh, walking towards us. Um, walking towards you or charging towards you? I just want to double check. Uh, no, walking. <laughs> Luckily. Um, baby, bear, baby bear did try and open up the, the door. <laughs> of the, there, he was very smart. He had his mouth on the door handle and um, our driver quickly locked the door. And he, there's a video of it. He did take a video of it, I, I, which I still have to get. Um, but it was quite, quite interesting. Um, the bottom center picture with the reflection, um, that was a male bear across, the, uh, across a pond. Um, a lot of water, of course, um, very swampy. Um, it's the tundra. But um, we just, I, I just, I saw the reflection and I just was like, this is never going to happen again. And, and had I been there when it was free, when it was frozen over with snow, I would never would have gotten this reflection shot. So, but see, here's the thing because you're a cultural photographer, you're, you have the keen sight to be able to see these pictures when they're coming up. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. I, and, and, I think I, I probably took about, I don't know, 6,000 photographs. Um, of course, I had two cameras with me. Um, and it, it's, it's one of those things, you're seeing so many bears uh, and up close, you, you can't stop stamping. You just are you, really can't. Are you using like a USB drive uh, for, your, for your picture uh, to hold your pictures or like, are you putting them into a laptop? Like, how do you typically, like what kind of equipment yeah. are you using like with respect to housing that? I, I, I keep my, I keep it on my chips okay. um, and I, I don't, I don't download it until I get back. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Let's jump into the next picture. This is a really fascinating series of pictures. So let's start with the dogs on the left-hand side here. Um, and actually that that's a, a low resolution photograph I gave you. I should have given you a higher resolution photograph. But um, that we, on our last day, um, when we went into Churchill, we got to do a, um, a sled ride with, with a man who, um, a, a, he's actually a Métis, um, a Métis uh, First Nation. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an indigenous group. Um, they're really, um, they're a mix of Cree, typically, or Inuit, and um, European. Okay. So somewhere in their heritage, there was a, uh, a marriage of a First Nation person and a European person. And, and they have their own cultural group called Meti. Um, so he, he is Meti, his wife is Cree, and they have a dog sled company that, um, you know, when, when the tourists are there, they do tours I and mean, tours, they do rides, um, but they also, you know, use their dog sleds for you know, actual purposes. Absolutely. So we got to go on a ride. There was no snow. So we were on a wheeled sled, uh, which was okay, but it, it was sunrise and it was just gorgeous and it was cold. And this is the boreal forest. Um, uh, Churchill, near Churchill is where the boreal forest starts. Uh, anything above the tree line is Arctic. But once you get to the, the tree line, then it's called boreal forest okay what is what looks like a teepee in the upper right hand side yep that it's a teepee he has on his land that is their that's their traditional this is where teepees come from um this is their traditional 
um, housing. Uh, he doesn't live in the TP, although um, he has it up there. He also, you know, has taught his children how to build a TP. Um, he teaches other people how to build a TP. So um, this this is not um, this is not like they're just for tourists. This is their their actual. I mean, he he has skills to build a TP. Excellent. And now, then the sleds in front are the snow sleds. Okay, I was going to say is are is there a is there a utilitarian need uh, or or is there some is there something like inside the TP apart from just like lodging like for example it could be somewhere that you would uh have heating or like for drying meats or things like that are you aware of like if there's a utilitarian purpose apart from just sleeping it's, and living it's and generally for lodging i mean there there might be other purposes that that I, that he didn't discuss um because we talked to him for quite some time really interesting guy um, he's won dog sled competitions. Um, he's oh, nice. participated in a, a Diderot. He has his own dog sled competition that's 2,500 kilometers long. And um, <laughs> yeah, a really interesting guy. Um, and this, um, this teepee they use for, you know, when they're bringing photographers out and stuff for the Aurora Borealis. Um, Nat, Nat Hab, Natural Habitat has a, an Aurora Borealis um, trip that you can take and um, they actually will use this uh, to sleep in and, and others and more just not just not the only one Excellent. and let's take a look at the picture on the bottom here um, that's the lodge that that's is the, the lodge. lodge and it's on wheels that's it is, crazy <laughs> those tires are five feet tall <laughs> they are really big yet you have to be up there because uh, there are bears all around you mm -hmm. um you are out in the tundra and the only thing connect you are you are um an hour from churchill uh at least an hour from churchill uh out on the tundra and and churchill is the you know the northernmost um town on the east uh, uh, of canada before the arctic um you know it sits right there arctic and boreal forest Mm -hmm. uh, it's still it's still part of the arctic it's it's above the boreal forest but you know it's leading into it um so you're out there you're on your own you know um it, it, you better have supplies when you're out there so uh nat nat Hab does a great job of uh, making everybody comfortable and happy and um and just a great experience are the cabins part of this as well i I'm curious. Yes, the the, um, the last two the last two are the cat the where the sleeping quarters. Okay. Um, so if you go from the right, the, the sleeping quarters you have a big viewing deck on the back. Okay. Um, then you go to the center and you have another viewing deck. So those those two those two end ca uh, are cabins. Okay. Then the next one there's another viewing deck and the one with all the the first one with all the windows is the lodge. Okay. And then the next one with all the windows is the kitchen and dining room. Okay. And then the, the one up to the front, that's the sleeping quarters for the permanent staff that stay up there eight weeks a year. It's like living in a car for eight weeks. <laughs> it is. And, you know, they, they used to um, move this uh, every season, but now they have a permanent, uh, they have permission from, uh, the First Nations and the Canadian government to, um, because they need to get permission from both, uh, to leave this out there um, all year long. Okay, very nice. And then, of course, the grand finale. The, I mean, obviously, well, I shouldn't say that because obviously everything we've seen thus far is amazing. It was incredible. I mean, we had one night um, that we, and again, I should have given you a higher resolution photographs where you could actually see the stars, but um, we got lucky our final night out there we had a clear clear night um i have an app on my phone because when i when i travel to places with the aurora um i i look at the kp index mm -hmm. which is the indication of possibility of aurora and it was showing a good possibility and it did not disappoint mm -hmm. it went all the way across the sky it was uh, I've seen the Aurora before, I've seen it in Iceland, but this this one was just incredible. Now they call the Aurora over here, the Aurora Borealis, and the one in Iceland has a little bit of a different name, is that correct? 
No, they're both they're both the. That was Aurora Borealis. Borealis. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. the, the northern everything in the northern hemisphere it's the Aurora Borealis. Okay. Um, when you, you can see it when you go down to Antarctica, and that's the Aurora Australis. Ah, Aurora Australis. Okay, yeah. got it. Well, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely breathtaking. I really would like to see that someday, and I know my partner is definitely up for the trip as well. So let me ask about some takeaways. So. What are the pros of going on a trip like this? Everything. <laughs> uh, um, in all reality, the the pros are, um, and I'm and I'm a person that's not a big on organized tours and travel um, because I want to see what I want to see and do what I want to do. Um, this, however, it's something you have to do this way. You cannot do this on your own. Um, you can get up to Churchill, you can, um, you know, book another company to go out, um, price wise, maybe a little bit cheaper, but, you know, to be honest with you, if you're staying in town, like even the trips that where they have that are in town and then go out onto the tundra. Um, every morning you're an hour from the tundra so you're you're losing time an hour there and an hour back um, so the, the pros of this are you know convenience um, uh, what you see what you're able to see in a short amount of time and um, although it, it, very expensive I mean we're looking at the eleven thousand dollar mark yeah um, well worth it and it's a once in a lifetime experience. because it is once in a lifetime i mean the people i met this was their second time I mean, he uh, he had gone with his first wife and now he was with his second, like, wife. second wife i was like hey, yeah. how you doing um but um and he had done the in-town version the first time but it, it, incredible um it, it, for most people it is a once in a lifetime thing and seeing polar bears i mean you know to see guys like this <laughs> I mean, come on right i brought one home with me even though he's of know, course yeah, he's the only one I will pet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise they pet you. That's the kind of reverse, and it's not a very pleasant pet. Not a, not a pleasant pet, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. no. Um, so obviously things to be aware of, cost considerations cost. Are, are, are definitely there. Um, doesn't sound like travel was too much of an issue, but obviously being vaccinated and making sure that you're um, – making sure the testing is done in an appropriate amount of time as well. You as must be vaccinated to yeah. go on any NatHab trip. Okay. Um, which I liked, I appreciated. Uh, they did enforce the mask rule, um, yeah. which was good. And, but everybody, you know, everybody was good about that anyway. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it, it just, there, and they, everything was super clean. There were, there was gel everywhere. So, um, and they send you, they send you a kit with masks and gel before you even leave, uh, in case you need it, you know, um, nice. Yeah, it's but so things to be aware of. Um, if you're going on a trip like this, they are taking extreme precaution. They, you know, in, 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 ter in terms of COVID, um, they are aware. <laughs> they are not risking your health. Um, they are going to make sure you're safe again, which is why they also re require everybody to be vaccinated. Makes sense. And then any value adds, cost savings, or best practices that you would recommend to someone trying to do this for the first time? Yeah, I mean, I, I would make the most of your time. If you have extra time, um, you know, stay a little bit longer uh, before or after. Uh, it's worth it. Uh, maybe, maybe go to uh, another city that, you know, um, uh, John and Shannon, the people I met, they, uh, they were going to go spend four days in Vancouver mm. because they had to fly back through Vancouver as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I would make the most of your time because a, a trip like this, you're, it, it is a short amount of time. It's one week. Um, it's, you're, you know, because polar bear season is short, uh, they can't do longer trips than one week, mm. uh, because otherwise they're never going to be able to get everybody in. Um, uh, but you know, th those are the, those are the, that's the value add that you could do, um, best and best practices as well. And obviously take lots of cameras with you and, or photography ability with you. Yeah. And you know what, there were people that only like, um, the people I was with John and Shannon, he, he went out and upgraded to the iPhone pro. 
uh, the new 13 Pro and yeah. just before the trip, they didn't bring a camera. Um, I, I, you know, even though I have my own photography company and I sell my photographs, uh, I told anyone on the trip that they were more than welcome to ask me and I would give them a high resolution, high resolution photographs. But then the, the, the travel company itself also uh, creates a uh, Google Photos um, uh, bank where people can add and they add and then you can take from there, which is really nice. Do they charge for that or is it? Nope. So they're not, so they're not nickel and dime you the whole way they through. Are, they do not nickel and dime you. When you, when you paid for the trip, you've paid for it. That's it. Okay. There's no other money you have to pull out of your pocket. I like that a lot. Excellent. Yeah. Well, in order for people to find these extraordinary photos of you and of um, all the stuff that you do, uh, there's a couple ways to reach you. Obviously on Facebook, we can find you there, uh, but also on your website and on, through Instagram at FredericoPhotography.com, correct? Correct. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, Marissa, I got to say, it's always a pleasure to have you here. I'd love to hear about your incredible excursions. I know you've got a couple coming up, so I'm hoping to revisit you then as well. Galapagos so, is next. Galapagos <laughs> is next. So we're definitely going to keep track on that. So again, also going with NatCab. Yes, absolutely. I fell in love. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, I definitely want to see the pictures as well. So I know absolutely. there's going to be, a, um, and in fact, when we get when we get to talk about that, I'll, I'll be interested to find out if you're going to just a couple of islands or if you're going to a lot of the islands. And, a lot. This one is a bigger trip. Okay, fantastic. I, I'm going to be excited about it. <laughs> and we're, we're staying one night in a camp, a tree camp with the tortoises. Oh my gosh, that's going to be amazing. I just, oh. yeah, pinch me. <laughs> some more comes so stay tuned I'm checking them off my bucket list <laughs> gotta get that map behind me scratched off a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> well marissa again thank you so very much i really appreciate you're it you're welcome now for my students that are out there if you have any questions or comments or you'd like to learn more about anything please feel free to send me an email at scott at the and i'll be more than happy to respond to you if you like this video and you'd like to know when new videos upload hit that little bell icon right above you here in order to be notified about that. If you have not already done so, please feel free to subscribe. We are always welcoming people into our community and we really appreciate it. If you like this video, as always, please give it a thumbs up. But until next time, my name is Scott. I am the Professor Travel. I thank you so much and make every day a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.